cars symbolize American road racing's unbroken lineage, stretching back from this present day race modified triumph to this 1948 MGTC. And this elaborate, world famous track can trace its past to the streets of a tiny New York State village. As modern road racing celebrates its 25th anniversary in the United States, so does the incredible circuit where its history began, the Watkins Glen Grand Prix course. Twenty-five years at speed is brought to you by British Leyland, maker of these world-famous sports cars, Jaguar, MG, and Triumph. Great to begin with, and great today. Squadron, scramble. Forty bandits approaching ten. Good show. Like your first love, you never forget your first Spitfire. You not only get a car and a girl, but a piece of history. Watkins Glen is nestled in a wooded corner of upstate New York, 300 miles from the great cities of the eastern seaboard. 3,000 people live here, and save for its small state park and impressive fishing on nearby Lake Seneca, there is little to distinguish it from a thousand other small towns of the region. Except through a strange series of circumstances, it has become a world-famous center for motor racing. Today, Watkins Glen's main street is just another road in upstate New York. But 25 years ago, it was the scene of a bold new experiment in American motor racing. The year was 1948, when a select group of splendid amateurs gathered at Watkins Glen to revive a form of motorsport that had been ignored in America for 30 years. Oval track racing, epitomized by the Indianapolis 500, was our traditional style of competition. But racing on roads over natural terrain was distinctly European until a Watkins Glen resident talked the village fathers into staging a sports car race to boost the sagging tourist trade. Cameron Argetsinger, a youthful lawyer from Youngstown, Ohio, who spent his summers on Lake Seneca, devised a racetrack using the town's main street and a network of surrounding roadways. He received a sanction from the fledgling Sports Car Club of America, which invited a select group of wealthy foreign car enthusiasts from around the country for their first taste of real competition. While the drone of the Formula One cars practicing for the United States Grand Prix filled the air, we talked at the secluded stone bridge, once a famous landmark on the original circuit. Cameron, tell me a little bit about your personal involvement in that first Grand Prix 25 years ago. I took the idea to them because I had a car and I wanted to race in a road race and there weren't any such things in this country. They had a number of people of, a great, of, of much vision and it caught on in a manner that was unbelievable. But I'll never forget it. It uh, has to be a very high point in, the, in my life. And there were quite a number of people, a surprising number of people. I think the police estimated there were perhaps 10,000. In great expectancy, nobody knew what was going to happen. And then the flag dropped, and it was just an unbelievable cloud of dust and smoke and haze, and we were off. And uh, it, it's very hard to describe it, but I'll always remember it. You must have uh, had a certain advantage in that uh, you were uh, very familiar with the circuit, at least. My wife was convinced I was going to win it, and it wouldn't be fair to the other people, and they'd all go home mad because I ran it several days, several times a day all summer long. It borders on the impossible to describe the difficulties and hazards of Cameron Argetsinger's circuit. 
narrow and twisty, with an elevation change of over 500 feet between its highest and lowest points. It was at best a hodgepodge collection of public roads, and at the worst, one of the most dangerous race circuits ever conceived by man. It's among the most demanding circuits that were ever raced on, ever. John Fitch is one of the best sports car drivers the United States has ever produced. This lean, quiet man from Connecticut drove for the great Cunningham team and is the only American ever to be invited to drive for the vaunted German team from Mercedes-Benz. Now retired to a career as a highway safety expert, John recently returned to Watkins Glen to relive those wild days of the late 1940s. It was all very experimental and astonishing to all of us who were participating. People were kind of uninformed and everybody was learning their job and we were racing in cloth helmets and no seat belts. And it was just a big wild adventure, a happening, which is retained today. John, um, with a racetrack, sometimes no more than 15 feet in width, wasn't it very difficult to pass? Very difficult on the back straight that goes under the railroad underpass there. It was like sort of aiming the car and you hoped you got through. And the road was quite bumpy. The cars would chatter and shake and carry on. I still can picture those allards slewing from one side of the road to the other. How about the old stone bridge? That's a very famous point on the circuit. Was that a particularly difficult section as well? Well, people treated it with the respect it deserved, and uh, not much happened there because it, uh, it was so obviously uh, unforgiving that you didn't take liberties with it. Is, was it a tiring course to drive? Gosh, I think uh, people were so keyed up in those days, and it was also new and exciting, and the, the races were not very long that uh, nobody thought about that. I'm sure it was exhausting, <laughs> mentally. <laughs> At okay. least. The fastest part was the downhill, big sweeping bend there, and I don't remember, I don't think anybody knew how fast the cars went, because the speed was sort of over the design of any of the small cars at the time, and the big cars, uh, you just couldn't even glance at a tachometer for a split second. You, know, you wouldn't conceive of any kind of uh, motor competition on a circuit like this today. It'd be out of the question. Practically everything about racing at Watkins Glen has changed, but the racers. The old track is now a series of rutted back roads, long since replaced by a multi-million dollar artificial circuit. But the men who race there are essentially the same. The stars of the Grand Prix and Can-Am are pros but a vast percentage of the men who drive at the Glen each year are amateurs. Doctors, lawyers, salesmen, weekend warriors, as it were, racing as they did in 1948 for the sheer love of competition. I couldn't be happier if it was me sitting in the seat. I couldn't have done it, probably. I was going out of overdrive then. Well, I saw you go out of overdrive, and I knew when you went out of overdrive, he's going to... What's overdrive? We're going to do it half here, Robert. Nothing. You said one more lap, and it's another lap, and well, it's the you deserve it. It's the you deserve it. <laughs> I can't think of anybody I'd say. Let's put it in the time. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it worthwhile, I guess, right? <laughs> it was worthwhile. I was right. <laughs> The Watkins Glen Grand Prix was staged on the old network of public roads for five years. Its success triggered similar races to be organized at places like Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, and Pebble Beach, California. The cars got larger and faster, and crowd control bordered on the chaotic. 
Sanctioning squabbles and financing problems compounded the difficulties. And in 1952, a spectator was killed by a speeding race car. New York State outlawed racing on state roads in the ensuing Fuhrer, threatening to end competition at the Glen forever. We no longer could get the insurance. We no longer could get the permit from the state to run on the state road. So we had to go elsewhere for a circuit. A man who remembers those bleak days is Henry Valent, a lawyer and lifelong resident of Watkins Glen. He has presided over the financial fortunes of the Glen racing experience since the beginning. Despite the 1952 tragedy, Watkins Glen remained hooked on racing. An organization led by Argot singer Malcolm Curry, the local newspaper editor, who was to later become general manager of the present track, and Valent set up another circuit on town-maintained highways. Beginning a tradition that continues to this day, the community pitched in, operating concession stands, taking tickets, directing traffic, and selling programs, part of the profits of which went to the Watkins Glen High School senior class. While Curry and Argetsinger ran the races, it was Henry Valent who quietly and effectively set up the nonprofit Grand Prix Corporation. Surely, Henry, every citizen of Watkins Glen has a great franchise in the success of the Watkins Glen Grand Prix Corporation. This is definitely so. Uh, the people of the community own the Watkins Glen Grand Prix. It's their corporation, and they have the say of it. The second Glen circuit was a compromise that lasted only until the corporation could purchase 550 acres of land south and west of the village. There, a special 2.3-mile racetrack would be built. Its designer was William Milliken, a brilliant engineer from the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories, and himself a respected driver during the early days of the Glen. Bill, when you conceived the racetrack in 19, late 1955, uh, what were you looking for in terms of design qualities? Well, of course, we were trying to get a pretty high lap speed. As I remember it, Cam Hoggetsinger was interested in having one of the fastest circuits in the country. And then, of course, we were interested in getting a circuit which, even at high speed, was a relatively safe circuit. Millikan's track was a simple teardrop configuration that immediately became the fastest road course in North America. As the organizers in the community plowed profits back into the facility, its stature in the racing world increased. By the early 60s, most of the greatest cars and drivers were competing at the Glen. Each year, mobs of people turned out to see such legendary machines as the Cobras from California, the Chaparrales from Texas, swirling around the track. After a decade of use, the cars began to overwhelm the circuit. Lap speeds were knocking on 130 miles an hour, and the course was criticized as too narrow and too confined for safety. Accidents increased. Although serious injuries were avoided, the management decided to begin a multi-million dollar remodeling program. A new extension increased the circuit length to 3.3 miles. Bill, in 1971, you added a mile to this circuit. What was the specific intent of that extension? Well, there were many intents, in fact. One, of course, was to come up with some better spectator area. Of course, another was to continue to improve the safety of the circuit, which we did by widening it you remember we knocked off the top of the hill up here so that we had better sight distance. Of course, we went in for a lot of guardrail. Many other improvements, including moving the start-finish line. How do you feel about it in terms of driving challenge? Uh, as far as I can tell in talking to the various drivers, they feel it's a very challenging circuit. I think the additional part that we added really added a lot to it. Before, the course was too straightforward. There were only about five turns, and it definitely put an emphasis on power. 
now it's more of a driver's course, and I think everybody likes it better. Well, this new um, new loop that you've added and the new service on the pit area, I mean, it really is, um, it's obviously now in the, in the top class. It's one of the, one of the best racing tracks. It's very interesting. There are many areas where you can lose or gain an awful lot of time, and, and uh, that's what makes it very interesting, actually. Well, I think it ranks right up uh, with the top of the circuits around the country. I think the track now is one of the most beautiful race tracks in the world today, and, you know, I can only compliment everyone for it. Just under 200 yards, brake hard, car swoops around a bit over the bump, down to fourth gear, to a long looping end corner here. The old circuit you've got the right, we go straight on through the bump, over the rise, down to the sharp left hand, down to third gear again. Nice smooth corner. A quarter century of high speed growth. Watkins Glen now ranks with Indianapolis and Daytona as one of the three most famous racetracks in America, and it stands among the very best in the entire world. As the site of the United States Grand Prix, its rise from those ragged days of 1948 surely qualifies Watkins Glen as one of the most astounding and unlikely success stories in sporting annals. Back on the old course, tightest corner on the new track. Tight left hand to keep the wheel off the inside edge, left the car right to the outside. From the beginning, the essence of Watkins Glen has been the Grand Prix. First as a sports car race, and now as a world championship event for Formula One cars and drivers. It is an institution with a tradition rivaling that of the Indianapolis 500, the Rose Bowl, and the Kentucky Derby. Cameron, the first 10 years of Watkins Glen were essentially amateur events, and yet you harbored this dream of a U.S. Grand Prix. Well, the first 10 years of racing at Watkins Glen established a base from which we could move into professional racing and Grand Prix racing. From the time we actually were awarded the Grand Prix of the United States uh, until the date of the race was uh, a little less than eight weeks. So it was pretty rushed, both in promoting it and organizing it. We expected a huge crowd. We had a huge crowd. And that morning, I remember driving around the circuit and seeing white shirts in places where never before had there been spectators and being scared to death. <laughs> Our safety precautions were, were sufficient. When the flag fell, and that field took off. Of course, there's nothing like a Grand Prix start anywhere else in the world. Anyway, I think I just sat back and said, <laughs> it happened. Well, this was a gamble because it had failed at two other racetracks in the United States prior to that. Therefore, it would seem that that step into Formula One racing with all of the major expense it involved had to have been a, a turning point for Watkins Glen. Yes, there's no question it was. It had to be the major turning point probably the single greatest accomplishment of those of us who were involved in Watkins Glen racing from the beginning. Even after the United States Grand Prix had established itself as a successful event, Watkins Glen continued its pioneering role in all forms of racing. The circuit witnessed the most competitive levels of the sport, from open wheel formula cars to the 200 mile an hour, unlimited horsepower, Can-Am sports racer. While racing at the Glen features variety, its public image thrives on a single event, that great autumn happening known as the United States Grand Prix. October is the traditional month for racing at Watkins Glen. The first race took place then, and that custom has been carried on to this day. But now the United States Grand Prix attracts perhaps 100,000 people, and the Formula One circus, the elite of the international racing scene. The silver anniversary purse exceeds $250,000, making it the richest road race in the world. But somehow, the track that Curry, Argetsinger, and Valent created 
embodies more than the giant crowds and the blockbuster purses. The racing community returns to the Glen each year for broader reasons than the pursuit of speed and riches. I think uh, the whole community of Watkins Glen put their whole heart and soul into this race. I think they've done a fantastic job. It really, they deserve every, uh, every credit. But the amount of people that turn up to watch this race and make a weekend of it, or more than a weekend, is um, quite startling. I'm amazed to see, and it's becoming, seems to be becoming something of an institution now, and uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Watkins Glen to camp, carouse, and carry out a sort of last rite of summer. From their vantage points behind the fences, they watched Jackie Stewart, undisputably the finest Grand Prix driver of the day, win an effortless victory. His supremacy denied the crowd a close race, but they went home with a peculiar satisfaction that comes after witnessing the best of the best, no matter what the endeavor. If there has been a theme to the history of Watkins Glen, it has been this fascination with excellence, its refusal to settle for anything less than first class. If pride rather than people was the measure of a community's size, Watkins Glen would surely be one of the largest cities in the world. are marvelous things. They can put together something as rugged and reliable as a front disc brake, or as precise as a carburetor. They can assemble a four-speed all-synchro mesh gearbox, or guide a race-proven engine into an all-steel monocoque body. There are over a thousand pairs of hands at Abingdon, England. Together, they build the MGB. MG, the sports car America loved first. <laughs> Completion of the United States Grand Prix marks the 25th anniversary of competition at Watkins Glen. Will Watkins Glen be here 25 years from now? While the future of racing is unclear, its success is most certainly tied to tracks such as this. If the tracks fail to grow, the sport will fail to grow as well. 
But as long as racing attracts the kind of bold enthusiasm that has been such a vital part of the Watkins Glen history, its future seems bright indeed. Five years at speed has been brought to you by British Leyland, maker of these world famous sports cars. British Leyland salutes the great competitors who made history at Watkins Glen. <laughs>